I'm going to talk about context graphs, or what we call context graphs, at Calibra. As some of you, or maybe all of you might know, Calibra is a company that does data governance, where we try to enable our customers to reap as much value from their data. But I will talk more about what Calibra is, because these context graphs are what lay at the core of the whole system. So as I, the talk progresses, you'll get to know us a little bit better. But first, a little bit about me. Oh, wow. Um, I have a totally different background than maybe a lot of you. I've only been dabbling into these knowledge graphs for the past two months. Uh, I have a background in cognitive science, where I worked on machine learning to help me understand how the visual perception works, how the brain works, how we perceive objects in the world, how we do depth perception. And on the other hand, I also used what we know about neuroscience and about how the brain works to build new machine learning models. But representations of knowledge or of, of visual representations are not really unfamiliar to me. I worked, for example, on how we represent objects in our brains. How do humans represent objects? One of the things I worked on is like representing objects as a hierarchy of their subcomponents. Other things I did in the past was like illusions. And illusions are a very interesting way to understand how well, visual representations work and how the brain works because they break stuff. And when stuff breaks, that's where you learn stuff. And you might see that, I, hopefully, that you see the white things rotate a little bit. And the cool thing there is there is actually no physical cues in there to make you perceive that rotation, yet you do. So there is a whole big of subjective knowledge there. You infer something different than is actually out there. So I want to use this to segue into this slide and prepare you that I'm going to use a cognitive science view on, on everything I'm going to be talking about. So here I start out first with saying I'm going to take this subjectivist view on the world. And that means that all our experience, all our knowledge is subjective and we can say that there is no such thing as objective truth out there. Why do I say that and why do I begin with that is that we can take a bunch of people and all of us have different experiences in the world. We have different knowledge about the world. We know specific things about the world. Some of us know, might know good restaurants in Queens. Others might know good cocktail bars down near Wall Street. But we all have different views of the world. On top of that, we might have very different models of how the world works, very different representations. And none of us might necessarily have the true one. So starting with this premise, we all might have different representations. We can replace this world with an enterprise. And then we get closer and closer to what Calibra is actually doing. You have different people at a company. You have HR people, developers, people in sales and marketing, and they all have a different model of the company. They know specific things about the company. They have a different model of how they think that the company works. And if you would even add the customer of that enterprise in the loop, you might get very vastly different representations of how a company is working. And I added to this the word business, the term business semantics management, because that's what Calibra is kind of founded on. It's the idea of processes, technologies, and cultures you're trying to establish so that people get facilitated into talking and conversing to create a general knowledge about what the company is. Get rid of that heterogeneous metadata that's floating around so that you get one overarching knowledge structure. And that's exactly what Calibra is doing. Calibra is a facilitator to reconciliate all these heterogeneous semantic information we all have, people have at a certain enterprise, to come to a general knowledge representation of what the company is. So, now I come to the idea of context graphs. It's just a word we put on it. You can also think of it as just a knowledge graph underlying it. But the idea here is that it's an agreed upon model of the enterprise. And I think that's the most important part. All these people have come together and they are facilitated through our system to come with the agreed upon knowledge representation of the enterprise, a model of the enterprise. You can even think of it in a different way and you give some agency to the enterprise and you say, okay, the enterprise itself has a knowledge representation of how the world around it works. But the second thing here is, of course, that information is contextualized. And this happens through the fact that we have not just one person's information, idea of the company that's in this, in this graph, but different people. And they create more and more connections to around certain business assets. 
So when I talk business assets, this can be anything, right? This can be data sets, business terms, reference data sets, anything you can think about that lives in a company, also policies. And they all give more and more context to each other because the, these people talk to each other, they create connections between the different departments such that there's more value coming around all of these different data assets. As it stands now, I can, I'm going to give like three properties of these context graphs, but as we, of course, innovate and change these things and do more research on this, we will probably ha end up with a lot more properties. Oh, nice. So what you would see there is, is a workflow. Um, but the idea here is, again, it's agreed upon knowledge, and I keep hammering on this because this is like the underpinning vision of, of Calibra is that you, there is value in contextualizing information based on these social agreements about what we mean with certain terms in a company. And as yesterday also was alluded to already, like people might not even agree on what they mean with the term customer, right? So here you have an idea, this, this happens within the system, but it's an asset approval process, someone will propose a certain business term, for example, and then you have a bunch of stakeholders who are encouraged to engage and be part of reconciliating this knowledge. Someone's gonna propose a business term, someone's gonna say, okay, you gotta add a description of it, another person says, no, I don't like the description, it should be this or that. So everybody gets engaged so that we get to the truth, this may be the wrong word, but that at least an agreed upon and trustworthy uh, data representation. The second part is there's an underlying what we call operating model, but you can think of it as a higher level ontology. And this higher level ontology just constrains what the data, the asset types are that can exist, the relationship types that can exist, and is also constraining how these asset types can relate to each other. And this comes from the fact that Calibra itself was an ontology, is based on research in ontology, right? So this kind of resulted in this, in this ontology. 10 years ago, it started, it started growing, changing, till we get to this higher level ontology, which is used at this point over more than 300 companies to represent their enterprise and they represent how they do data governance. Thirdly, that's one I like to th talk about because of my cognitive science background is the idea of granite semantics, right? We all know that a label in a graph has utterly no meaning if it has no reference to something in the world or reference to a description we all agree on what it is, right? I can put a label on a graph, it's a banana, but if it has no reference to there's something real in the world that's a banana, we, it has no semantic meaning. And the same thing can be true for like two people. They might be talking about customer, they have a representation of what a customer is, and they can have a conversation because, well, so there, there should be customers in the middle there. Uh, <laughs> because they refer to the same kind of people in the world that they would call customers, right? And again, this is agreed upon. They had this, there's a definition now that a customer is, for example, the customers of the company that they sell a product to. But they can also refer to totally different things, right? One person can be an HR and they refers customers for this person are employees. And in the other case, they're actually the clients or the people you sell to if it's a salesperson. And the way that to alleviate that, of course, is to create communities. And a community, you can think of it as a linguistic silo where people have a certain idea of what the meaning is of certain terms, and that's totally fine. And that's also nicely incorporated into Calibra with communities and domains and specific knowledge. Now, we can also go one step further, and you may take what I'm gonna say with quite a couple of grains of salt. Um, in Calibra itself, the data set isn't present in it, right? In a data governance center, we have the data is not present in it, it just ingests some schemas, the metadata is represented within the system. But there is a link to the data set itself. And we can say there also, you can think of it also, there's a node representing certain header, certain business term, and some meaning could be, you can think of it that meaning is in propagated from the data set because you actually have some physical connection to what the data is, into this graph in that direction. And the other way around, you can think of it because you create all these contextual knowledge, all these connections to this data set, you also inject meaning towards what this data set actually means. 
And this is very important because if you just look at the data set, often there could be the weirdest things in there without these headers or whatever being linked to business terms, policies, usages, you might have no idea what this data set is for. And then we get to the idea of like these null values that are in there that have no meaning. I, last week we were dealing with a data set, so it was a data set of elderly people, and in the age table, 99 was the null value. That's very annoying when you're dealing with people that are like elderly people because you don't know if the 99 was a real person or it was a null value. But that's just a start, right? We can extend this grounding to maybe add some sub-symbolic models to that. And what I mean by that is you can have a node somewhere that says car, and that's linked to a model that can, can, can detect a car in the real world. That way you have a probabilistic model linking the actual label to a thing in the world. Go one step further even and add a sensor to this network. You have a node that says, let's say, average customers coming to the store and you have a link to a people detector or something so that you can actually have a physical uh, grounding, then you have an actual perceptual grounding, nothing better than that actually. Oh, sorry. So what does this mean in the end for customers? So what they see within our system is something like this. This is like a snapshot of one part of this graph. And Centered on, give me a second. centered on this data set, for example, it gives ideas of different business terms related to it, other data sets related to it, um, certain rules, policies, data sharing agreements, all things that give more and more meaning to what this data set actually is and what it's used for. So when our system, it kind of enables the customer to, to build these kind of graphs and so that they can answer specific questions, right? What is being governed? Exactly, exactly what's in the graph? Uh, why it's being governed? So we have links to policies saying why it should be governed. Uh, who is governing it? And then we're dealing with what communities are dealing with this, what domains are, are dealing with this. And then an important one, one second, is to know where and when things go. And that has to do with the data flow. And for that, you have things like these data sharing agreements, but there's also data usages. And this is very important if we think now what GDPR came on and CCPA coming up, it's very important to know who, what, where, and when did something with the data. And that I can't stress this more, more that this is a very important thing and people can use that. And in that way, like we have more than 300 customers using this right now to be able to reason about risk and about value throughout these graphs and you applying it to data privacy. So you can say, okay, wait, I have this sensitive data element. Can I track it through the graph and see what, when a breach happens, who would be affected or what would be affected in the system? All right, but this is, of course, just the start of what we're doing, right? This is what exists right now. And of course, since we're a bit, we're in research, we want to do more and we want to, of course, leverage these, these graphs for AI ML. We already had a lot of talks on this, so I don't want to dwell too much on it. But on the one hand, I, I wrote here escaping data hoarding. I think I, I might have misunderstood the word hoarding a bit here. But the, what I wanted to say here is that people seem to be gathering more and more data because they think I have these data hungry algorithms, I need a ton of data. And in some cases, of course that's true, but in some cases you don't have that much data to your disposal and you want to deal, actually leverage this domain knowledge that a knowledge graph gives you. So I see a lot of things happening that's really beautiful, trying to get away from the schism that that's kind of happened between the symbolic reasoning and the official neural network somewhere like 80s, 90s, and now that they're fusing back together to become these more powerful algorithms and actually doing very interesting stuff. And we're doing one of those things by uh, doing work on explainable AI with the university in Brussels. And what we're doing there is exactly what uh, the speaker from Talis uh, alluded to yesterday. We are leveraging the domain knowledge that exists in these knowledge graphs within Calibra to make decision trees more explainable. So we're doing exactly that. On top of that, and you can see there like a chatbot thing, we're also trying to ingest the knowledge that the expert has that is creating the Data, the, the model of 
whatever their analysis is, by having them interact. So the explainability is injected in two directions. One side, the domain knowledge that exists within the system, and the other hand, the expert knowledge that the person uh, who is building the model is putting forward. But, um, I'm not gonna say everything I put on these slides because after thinking about it more, I, have, I want to say some other things also. The idea here is that with great knowledge comes great responsibility and I wanna stress this pretty strongly. There is already some research happening on how we can do access control and, and knowledge graphs, but there of course are some problems with that. You have these ideas like maybe symbolic reasoning is known to like maybe breach things like um, privacy preserving mining algorithms like differential privacy. So you might just say, okay, you can only touch, you have this differential privacy, you get an epsilon of what, two. And then, oh, but you also have access to our knowledge graph. Now suddenly you can probably reason about stuff you weren't allowed to see. Second thing is you give people a very narrow view of what they can see in a knowledge graph, but now they're able to reason about this and they might be able to reason about stuff beyond the view that were, they were given. But I think the most important thing I wanted to br bring forth here is that although we might want to be building these huge knowledge graphs and merging all the knowledge that's freely available on the internet and we're aggregating essentially, we might be able, we might be dreading a problem here where we're gonna be using data that exists in a certain context that is, that has certain values and certain purposes and using it outside of that context. So to give a very brief example, um, Chase was canceling some Sapphire reserve cards. I think this happened like a year ago uh, because people were misusing all the point system, right? But one person couldn't figure out why their credit card was canceled. So as so often, online community to the rescue and they found out that it was canceled because Chase used to do, um, <coughs> minimize their, their reputational risk, they used the LexisNexis to make a decision about credit cards. At this point, we are breaching a context in which this data exists and people can expect it to be used for legal stuff and using it within a financial context. The question here is, do we find this in an appropriate use of this data or inappropriate? I'm not gonna make a judgment about that. But it's important to think about the three ways of data flow. One is the way it should be flowing. The other one is the way that the users or the data subjects expect the data to go, where it should, they expect it to go, and the way it's actually flowing. And how these things collide with each other, we're actually doing research on that right now. But it's important to keep these things in mind. Because context and the purposes and values of that are related to that context in which the data was created is important. So I am gonna end with this note as takeaway that with great data comes great responsibility. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Vicky. So we actually have um, time for a couple of questions. Thank you, Vicky, for this. Um, quick question on the higher level ontology there, the operating model. So yes. great platform to generate the social agreement. What about the underpinning model and how do you make that available or how do you share it with customers and how do you facilitate the agreement on the underlying model? So the, the right, let me go back quickly, right? All right. So the higher level model just says that there is something like, there is a an, an business asset that's related to something else. But if they say the business asset has, can have certain instantiations, which they can choose themselves, of course. It's just a very high level ontology defining uh, general relationship types. It could also be there's a relation between a report and a data set and a column, but they can fill in this themselves, what this column is, or what this data asset <coughs> is, or what the data set is. 